Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Maddie B. We got to stick start off the show talking about the Michigan State football position because as soon as we recorded the show last week, in the middle of the night, Michigan State hired Mel Tucker from Colorado. After Which is really he- ironic that you say it that way because in the middle of the night, while he was telling Colorado boosters and trustees, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. His agent is negotiating his deal to make him the next coach at Michigan State. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, if you listen to the show, you were like, well, the news already broke, but we record the show live on Tuesday, and I hit publish right after, and it publishes sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. usually. And then it should show up in your feed whenever iTunes updates it. So we really don't have any control on that. But as soon as I publish it, I go to bed. And I think the original tweet from, was it Bruce Feldman or one of the college football writers came out at like 1241. And I thought, what timing? And you're right. That afternoon, I mean, whenever we did the show, he had already publicly turned down the job. While we were rec- we were recording, I think he was at a booster event. There's footage of him talking about integrity and all this stuff and selling recruits to your program. And literally, as soon as he left that deal, he was on a plane to Michigan. Like, unreal. I have no idea. If you were a recruit, I saw a lot of recruits coming after him. Some of them were, I, I think it was like a former player. Do you remember who that was? Yeah, it was, I believe it was Cowboys wide receiver Drew Pearson. Yeah, they were saying that they're recruiting uh, a son or a grandson or someone in the family and just straight up lied to them. And then, um, was it Brandon Rice? I think he's related to Jerry Rice if it's not his son. He tweeted out that, like, he, well, he would already, I think he signed with Colorado last week, but then he said that, like, as soon as Tucker got to Michigan State, Michigan State, all their social media started following him like they were going to pursue a transfer or something. So it's just a weird situation. And then they went all last week. They've been getting turned down by assistant coaches. He came in, announced that he was going to fire everyone from the Antonio staff after being turned down by his top choices. He ended up bringing back two of the guys with uh, Mike Trussell being one of them, the former interim coach. So, you know, that has to be awkward. And then he went and hired a bunch of his former staff at Colorado. So further gutting that team and all the players he just signed. So unbelievable. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lawsuit. I saw the ACC stepped up and they actually brought up Jim Harbaugh's. Remember he had that plan. He brought it up at media days like a year or two ago where he said that anyone should be able to transfer without sitting out a year immediately within their first year. And so I wonder if it was on the back of this Mel Tucker stuff, but the ACC conference trying to get back into the good graces after it was leaked, that they were giving millions of dollars to Congress to try to not pay players, which was another bullshit issue. I don't think it was even on our big board last last week. I should have put it on our topics this week, but it came out that it was like them uh, the actual commissioner, like the NCAA, Mark Emmert, and them, they were all donating money to try to stop them from passing laws to pay players. So just absurd. But then now they're on, now they're on board, Matt, with the transfer thing. When everybody laughed about it at media days a year or two ago, when Harbaugh made it up, because he was the first one to talk about it. He said, why don't just have him sit out an entire year or like let him have one free transfer or whatever he said without sitting out. And everyone was like, well, how's that going to work? Because then you basically have a free agent and everyone was shooting it down. But now, now whenever you have a negative publicity like this, everybody's on board. It's just baffling. Well, the only, the only argument that I would say that I'm, that I wouldn't be in support of it is the same people are going to complain when this goes through, they're going to complain about the playoff structure because it's, it's going to create a serious level of haves and have nots. And 
when you look at the group of five, I mean, when you see right now, and I'll use Florida State as the example, they took Norvell, who was who was in the group of five, and hired him up to be the coach at Florida State. Now that's happening at the coach level. If you get a free transfer, what's to stop that from from pulling a lot of these players from group of five schools into the power five? So the same people that complain, well, the top four, your Clemsons, your Ohio States, your Alabamas, you know, they're they're going to continue to just cherry pick who they want, and it'll be a matter of of the other teams having to make do with less. Yeah, but I think they can offset that because they can look at your actual scholarship limit. So all they have to do is take a look at, okay, you have a 25-person role. If you have a first-time transfer that hasn't played or whatever they end up doing, like a first-year transfer without sitting out, they count against your scholarship limit. So all the teams that are already cherry-picking, they're already getting the benefit of the doubt because they're in the playoffs. And having a limited playoff like this has really hurt recruiting because now you're seeing the top teams. I think, do we talk about it last week where there's only like one or two teams in each conference that are actually recruiting at a high level or at least a high enough level to win the national championship. I'm not saying win the conference because you might get lucky and win the conference, but whenever a team sneaks into the playoffs like that, it hasn't been pretty Michigan state hasn't recruited enough, was able to win the Big Ten, got killed in the playoffs. Washington, killed in the playoffs. Even Oklahoma, I mean, they had a good run. I think they went to overtime the one year, but they're right at the limit. And so whenever you're looking at that, you need to have the horses to not get blown out in the playoffs. And so I I think until they expand the playoffs, not every coach is going to be able to sell that. There's only going to be a couple of teams like you stated, Clemson being in it every year. It's going to be very hard for Florida State and other schools to claw back into it because all they have to do is say, yeah, remember when Florida State was good? Yeah, that was years ago. Here, I'm Dabo Sweeney. Look at all my rings. I was the coach for that. Florida State, they can say, Norvell, he, what does he want? That's all he has to say, and then he's going to be head and shoulders above. That's why it was bold, I thought, for Ohio State to just name Ryan Day the head coach without doing a full coaching search and trying to bring someone else in because whenever Trestle went down, they went the interim route and they brought in Urban Meyer. So like a lot of times whenever you're able to bring in a coach that has the same hardware that says, hey, look, I won a national championship. Now you're only having a handful of coaches that have had success in the playoffs and the playoffs have been going for how many years now? Six? I feel like that's right, but I could be wrong on the number five. Yeah, right. You're right. So, part of the year after Florida State won the national championship. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's going to be easy for a team to climb in? I don't, necess- I don't think it's going to be easy for a team to climb in, just like I don't think it's easy for a group of five school to get into to make the college football playoff. I don't think that it matters. And I don't think that it's going to move the needle that that far because you're still going to have the same system where the kids from that, you know, I I think what you may end up seeing is you may see some of the, like the Clemsons and the Alabamas, you may see them push more kids out and and trying to force them into other programs. Like if, if they're following what you're saying and affecting scholarship numbers, they may just try to push kids to either Juco or push them out so that, if it doesn't seem like they're going to pan out in a year, you know you still have the one free transfer, have that tough conversation and get them to move on so that they have that scholarship spot for someone that they're willing to move into that spot. And that might be something where you can negatively recruit. I don't know. Um, I mean, it could also come and be the same thing where you give them a one-year transfer role, but you also enact in in terms of paying players a four-year scholarship limit. Or like basically a guarantee that counts against your scholarship count. So like if Clemson pushes somebody out that has played and is beyond their one year transfer rule, because I think the way Harbaugh was talking is you get one free transfer like after your first year or whatever. I don't think he meant that it was unlimited. 
So you had like the freshman role where if you didn't fit in on a program or you were sold something or the coach left, then you were there. And then once you were locked in beyond that period, that's whenever you would sign the rest of your contract because the NCAA makes you sign a contract every year for people that didn't play um, college athletics. You go in, they basically make you sign away your likeness. So you can't make any money. They have a guy that sits there and tells you all the rules and asks you a bunch of questions uh, about things that you've been doing, probably because they talked to coach or your athletic director or whatever. And they say like, okay, are you still doing this? Uh, we heard you were, you collected money for this. Are you, you still doing that? Cause you're not allowed to do that. And so anything like that, they sit there and they make you sign a paper, basically just saying like, Hey, we're going to take some pictures of you. They do like a media day staying where they take pictures of you and things like that. So I would assume that happens for every school. And I mean, I went through it. That's how I know about it. So they sign that paper away. All they have to do is the next year they come in, they say, it's not really the coaches weren't there. It was like the NCAA guy. And then they had like your whole team came in. So it was like, hey, baseball team, you got to go down to the athletics building and take care of your NCAA stuff. And so like they were the compliance people and they came in and signed all your stuff. That's all they have to do with recruits. Say, hey, are you transferring or are you going to lock in your scholarship deal for three years guaranteed? Which means even if the school forces you out, that original school is going to have you on the books for the four years or whatever. I mean, you can look at it from, I think it was Harvard or maybe Columbia. One of the Ivy League schools, they still have a rule that you can't play in the Ivy League if you're a graduate student. And so they had someone that transferred in. I think it's the leading scorer of Columbia. I saw this on Twitter today where he's leading the team. He's technically a junior, but because he either redshirted or transferred from somewhere after sitting out, he can't play his senior year because the Ivy League, he would be a graduate student at that point. He's already exhausted his four years because he did a red shirt and the Ivy League doesn't have red shirts, which to me is so idiotic. Then why are you even in the NCAA tournament? I think at that point, I mean, it, you're definitely hurting the students. I don't care how much better your Ivy League um, education is or whatever you say it is. But then why are you taking the NCAA's money? If you're not following their rules at that point, then don't go into the basketball tournament and try to milk that money because you always know whenever Harvard's in or whenever one of those schools is in the NCAA basketball tournament, they have all this story about how they're not just athletes, they're students too, and all this academic stuff. But then they actually have a guy that could really use the extra year. I don't know if he's not going to be able to jump to the NBA. He probably needs his degree. What does he do? because there's not there's nothing for him so that's my last bit on it do you have anything else on the NCAA I don't want to spend the whole show talking about it no I think we're ready to move on I know we went off on a tangent I apologize to people listening let's get into some football talk though yeah, negative news though well actually I don't know I saw a couple sides of this and I don't even know if it happened before last week's stuff, but the NCAA has re or the NFL actually, sorry, I'm off the NCAA. They have reinstated miles Garrett for the helmet hit on Mason Rudolph. And he's clear to start next year, which I'm trying to look at this without the Steelers goggles on. And I will say, I hate it because practically he attacked someone on the field. You suspended him from the rest of the year. Now you're going to go into next year and it's going to be like nothing happened. The Browns were not a playoff team. The Steelers were not a playoff team. You had a player attack another player on the field with his helmet. Could have been, I mean, it could have been a catastrophe. Could have cracked his skull. What if he swung and hit him in the jaw, broke his jaw? I mean, you have people at the game, kids watching on TV. Like, I mean, what if he hit him in the eye and his eye popped out or something, Matt? He's clubbing well, him with the helmet. Yeah, down and struck him. There's, there's all these hypotheticals. Yeah, he swung the helmet. I mean, he did the deed. I think they should have at least suspended him for the opening game and not let him play it all preseason. No, shut up. One game, Matt. Shut up. One more no. game. No. They can't have people punching each other on the field or hitting them with helmets. 
Matt, the NFL has a definite issue with off the field behavior. I mean, how many people had domestic abuse, um, whatever, like against them that played that's in the Super Bowl? That's a completely different. And that's issue. what I'm saying. They suspended that one guy for the entire year for off the field stuff. Yeah. This is an incident that happened on the field. People actually saw it. They remember it. Give them one more game for the regular season at the beginning of the year and tell them. The games that he got suspended for plus a fine. Who cares about the fine, Matt? The fine means zero. It's not like he's a walk-on or some guy. He was a top draft pick. He probably made more and like that was maybe what half a percent of his signing day bonus, whatever they find him. I don't even know what they find him. Make him do one more game and then make a big point about it because that's the kind of thing that they did with Ray Rice. When I remember when they were parading him around with his um, suspension and they were like, well, look, we're going to be hard on it after we initially weren't. All they have to do is say, look, you can't attack our other guys. That, that could be the Steelers quarterback of the future. You could have potentially ended his career. What are you doing? Stop it. I can't, believe, dr- I can't believe you're against it. You're just being dramatic. I, I think it, the moment's passed. Like with what you're trying to propose right now, it's almost the equivalent of like beating your kid two weeks later after you've already disciplined them. Like the moment's passed. The NFL, if they're going to be hard on them, be hard on them when it happened. If, if they laid that consequence down that they said, you know, it's going to be the rest of this year plus the first game next year, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah, but, but they didn't say, do that. They said indefinite. Well, well, guess what? Then they laid an egg on. Yeah, they this was their it. chance. That's what I'm saying. You're yeah, absolutely. They, but they didn't. They had the chance and they didn't. Yeah, they blew it this week. When they came back from that meeting, they should have said, look. <laughs> We want you to do community service. We want you to do all this other stuff off the field or whatever they wanted to do to clean up his image. But we're making an example out of you because you literally took the guy's helmet and hit him in the head with it. Like now now, the NFL celebrating a hundred seasons. How many times has someone snatched someone's helmet off of their head and beat him with it? One time. One one time. Exactly. You You don't want it to start happening all the time. Do you think it's honestly going to start happening again? Matt, if Miles Garrett punches a player next year, I'm going to bring this conversation back up. Good. Then he wouldn't have learned his lesson. Do it. <laughs> because there's no way. There's no way that he takes. You don't think to- I would remember? We have listeners that message us uh, stuff like years later after we said. So uh, someone will remind me. Good. <laughs> there's no way that's, that someone else is getting their helmet ripped off and beaten with it. Well, here's the other thing that came out of the, the same, I guess they had like the same off the field meeting or whatever, but Mike Tomlin came out and he defended Mason Rudolph against the racist remarks. Because if you remember, and this is why I, I th- still think they should have did one more game because he came out and after the fact weeks later, or maybe a week later, whenever it was, he said that Mason Rudolph re- was using racial slurs and that's why he tried to hit him with the helmet. But number one, there was a bunch of other players right there. No one else had said that. No one else heard anything. Mike Tomlin said it didn't happen. He said he talked to players, whatever. I thought they had him mic'd up, but I guess they didn't for that game. I tried to find information on that. So They shut off during the, during the play is what I, what I had read. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they shut it off during the play. I'm sure they didn't just, were they, all the players were swearing at each other. And so they probably were just like, oh man, what are we going to do? Let's can it. Oh, he just hit him in the head with the helmet. Like, oh, that's a bad look. Maybe he hit him in the microphone with the helmet. Well, I mean, I guess he was swinging the microphone. We would have got a clear view when the helmet went to hit him. But, but I mean, that comes out of it too. So I would say, number one, you have Tomlin calling him out on it. I think all, no, none of the other players said they heard anything. So I think at that point, you're looking at lying along with the hitting in the head of the helmet, I still think one more game. And I mean, if it was a different team, I'd probably have the same outlook just because it's not the off the field stuff. The off the field stuff, some of that, I, I feel like if, you do, if you're not in court, you're not going to jail. I mean, how many other jobs would you 
get fired for or be suspended for something like that where there's nothing that came out of it, just an allegation. I don't know. Why are you going to slap the hand that feeds you, though? What, Miles Garrett? Yeah. What's he feeding the NFL for? I don't know. The, no, Matt. The hand that feeds is the quarterback. They had a quarterback, a pretty boy quarterback at that, almost get mangled in the face. And then they could have turned into a hideous monster. You think females are going to turn into that? Like, oh, look at Mason Rudolph. What do you used to look like before his eye got crushed in on national television? There you go. Well, Cleveland had that offensive lineman that had a flag thrown in his eye. <laughs> I know. And that was a ref, though. I don't think that's another player. So that it ref should have been thrown in. I mean, directly into his eye. I don't know. That's that karma coming around. I don't know. You have any other thoughts on it? I, I think I, sp- I spoke my piece. Uh, I think you poorly spoke your piece. It's very easy to follow, Matt. He did the crime. Do one he more was, time. Uh, he have a consequence. Yeah, but that was kind of like, I'm going back to your child thing. That's kind of like saying, go to timeout. And then like I'm uh, 30 seconds later, you're like, okay, you can get him out. That's what it felt like. It, yeah. At the yeah, end of the season, when <laughs> none of the games <laughs> mattered and you let him go, it's not like, all right, go play. And then you come back later and you go beat them. Like, no, what are you doing? No, you, you just give it to them right at the bat. I don't think they should have said, well, I guess they were still reviewing the tape or whatever. And they found nothing else really there to come out and say, it's not like they reviewed the tape and said like, okay, yeah, Mason Rudolph did say that stuff. You're, you're free. I mean, if that came out and that's what they said, then I'm okay with him playing right away. But well, it's kind of and- like you hit him, then you lied about it. But we're we're still going to be okay now. But I'll say this is the point. Like, the NFL reinstated him. And then Garrett came back out. And I think he should have just let it go. And just let it go and move forward. Instead, he he brought the racist remarks back out. And I feel like at that point, you had a chance to to just let the issue go. But to continue to, to promote this lie, if I was Mason Rudolph, I would push slander charges. Because at this point, like it's it's hurting his reputation, and if the NFL isn't going to do it, then as a player, you don't want your own personal reputation to be affected. Then you you press charges because all of the people that that were there, that were present, that didn't hear you say those words, now it's in court of law where they have to they have to tell the truth, and you take them to the, you hit them in his wallet. But do you think that would really be a good idea? He's already a guy that might not make the team. Garrett's going to make the team. Garrett well, is 100% going to make then the then team. Then you better do it because you're going to need to get paid if you're be getting cut from the team. That would be a boss move. You get cut, then you sue Garrett for slander and take some of his money. <laughs> get that final paycheck. <laughs> but, I'm sure that they have some type of thing, though, where you can't sue other players, right? Yeah, they probably also have something about not beating someone with their helmet either. True. I wondered how that worked in hockey. Like, if you got into a fight and you lost, could you sue the other guy for assault? I would think you could. I mean, the, the, the film would be there to... But hockey kind of looks at that differently, though, so I don't think that that would happen. I've never seen yeah. a guy get hit with the football helmet there either. Yeah. Unless you're slashing him with your skate but there's already too many lawsuits and stuff i don't think we need another lawsuit it often cut someone <laughs> and that's happened before i've seen people bleed out on the ice all right anything else you got on the nfl um let me check here I, you want to talk about tom brady i know you do i know what i know we'll talk james winston imagine how much better he's gonna be here's your here's my hot take this week if you're a fantasy f- football player you want to make sure that you get Jameis on your team. He got LASIK. He's been he winning national championships without even being able to see. Imagine what his vision is going to be like this year. Now that he's actually going to have it has corrective vision. Matt, do you really think he wasn't wearing contacts? You obviously don't watch enough Jameis Winston in college. <laughs> he was squinting the whole time. He couldn't see anything. Well, what kind of coach then doesn't tell their player like, son, you having trouble seeing out there? 
Like, let's go down and get you some contacts. They give yeah. you contacts. There are companies that mail you free contacts, Matt, to try. You could just sign up for all the mailing lists and he didn't have enough to cover the year. Well, someone should have told Bruce Arians. It could have saved them some headaches. I did see that. I, I'm actually, I thought you'd forget about it. But no. what, what am I kidding? Who am I kidding? It makes even more sense to come to Pittsburgh. You can actually see the receivers. Well, it's a real fit. I saw some news from the doctors where they said that they still have to evaluate Roethlisberger's elbow and we'll know the last week of February, which will be the following week. So once you listen to this, you know that they'll be looking at his elbow. It didn't sound promising to me because they said something about Tommy John surgery. And I was like, great. If they get Tommy John, like, did he have Tommy John already? I, I forget why that even came up. But then Tomlin came out today and said that he there's no hesitation from him. He knows that Ben Roethlisberger will be ready by opening day. And so at this point, if he needed the Tommy John, I would hope he had it. Give him some of those horse muscles like they did in the – wasn't the Dominican Republic. They were trying to do that with some of their baseball players. They give him like a fake Tommy John where they just give him another – a stronger ligament. So they can throw harder, Matt. Get that deer spray. Yeah, deer spray, horse ligaments. And then they ship them to the Astros where they give them a buzzer. They plant it under their skin so they know if change-ups are coming. Muscle relaxers. <laughs> we'll get into the baseball a little bit later. But uh, I, I don't know. If he gets Tommy John, has any other quarterback ever had that? I don't know. But, but I mean, let's be honest. He's old. Yeah, he's old. Jameis is young. Bring on the young gun. Fire the cannons. Well, I'm thinking now with Tomlin sticking behind Rudolph, we're not going to get rid of Rudolph, and I have a feeling we're not going to bring anyone else in. So I nope. think the team is the team. No, because Ben could do the honorable thing and retire, and then you have the cap space to sign another franchise quarterback. When when does the when's the deadline? Is it March something? You can retire whenever you want. That's the benefit of being old. Yeah, unless you want to be an ass about it. And then you want to hurt the team. Because, Matt, you can't retire after the draft and be like, ah, I'm out. Like, if they're having this meeting for the medical stuff, I'm thinking they'll know by the end of February. They force him to retire or whatever. That breaks the contract. He's free to sign with whatever if he takes a year off. He can sign back or do whatever. But if he doesn't retire... Then they have that cap space where, or they have the cap issue. I think he's making, is it 33 million or something? So they have $1 million of cap room. You have to cut a bunch of other players to be playing, paying what three quarterbacks. I know Rudolph doesn't make that much, but that you're going to be paying two quarterbacks. One might never play again. Doesn't make sense. It'd be a pretty shitty thing to do. And they're, they're also, I mean, it's a, a nice thing that they're keeping Shazir on. They don't need to be paying two players who aren't going to be contributing on their on their fifty three. I know. When is Shazir's contract up? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, we've said it well, on the show. If you've been a long time listener, you know he's not coming back. I know some people Shay leave. Uh, I see it on the hashtag still on the Twitter bios whenever people are messaging me, but he's not coming back. Let's be honest. So, yeah, after that contract's up, they need to make sure that they don't do something dumb and re-sign him. Fair enough. I, I mean... Don't, don't have two players on your team that aren't going to contribute. That hurts That hurts your depth. It hurts your ability to feed a, comp- a competitive team. So, I think move on. I think, and, and I don't know that there's a quarterback in this draft that I would be willing to spend the money on. But I do think that depending on what, how expensive players are, I think it's worth exploring what some of these other quarterbacks are going to be because it is pretty. It is a pretty deep group of free agent quarterbacks coming out. And I'm looking at it, and I mean, this is what is ridiculous right now, Matt. Tom Brady makes a cool twenty three million. Guess how much Ben Roethlisberger made last year? One hundred million. Forty five million. 
highest paid quarterback 2019. This is um this is from NBC Sports. I mean, Matt Ryan was at 44 million. He was number two. Russell Wilson was the first. He's number three, the first uh, playoff quarterback on the list at 35. Any any of these other jokers make the playoffs? No, Tom Brady and Drew Brees um, tied for seventh. They both at 23 million. Ben Roethlisberger is eating double salary than what Tom Brady makes. And I bet Ben Roethlisberger could doubly eat out eat Tom Brady at a buffet. So it's worth it. He needs more when he goes out to eat. He needs more money. Tom Brady has his own diet, Matt, where he thinks he can live forever if he just eats fish and something else. I forget what I read. Of course. <laughs> you can buy it for only $225. Is that it? On his website, TB12. I have not bought it, so I do not know what the other secret is. I've only read the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't know. What, what can you do? You can't do anything. I think they have him on the books for $33 million, Ben. What are they going to get Jameis for? I, I actually wouldn't mind seeing him for $10 million. But where are they going to free that up? And, uh, Matt, if you're paying Jameis 10 and you're paying Ben 33 like you're not, you're not going to be in a good position. That's a pretty rough position to be in. But I will, I will float you one more thing. What if you brought in Jameis... And then also signed AB for $1 million. Why would you do that? Because you want the boys back together. Ben and AB. You sell all those season tickets. You get all the hype. I don't know. This team doesn't have any I, hype, Matt. I don't even know that I would sign him with your money. Well, now I'm thinking that if you lowball him, make him want to show that he wants to play no. for Roethlisberger. He loves him. He just apologized to him on Instagram or whatever. Yeah. And then oh. when Ben snubs him, then he'll go off and no, that's, that's a hundred percent not worth there. There's a reason that, that for as talented as he is, that no one's touching that. It's because there's no way you bring that cancer into your locker room. No, I don't think, I don't think you have the reason, right? I think that it's too much money for a risk of him not showing up or being in court or something else. Guess what? No, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't pay a hundred dollars. No, he's not worth it because as soon as he gets in there, all it takes is to get around the young players on your team and get them polluted with that same attention grabbing mindset. And you have an absolute nightmare on your hands. You want nothing to do with that from a culture and a team building standpoint. No, I already know how they can approach it. They just got to tell him that he won. Remember Le'Veon Bell came out. He thought he won the deal. You just tell him, A, B, you won. You're back. You get you get to hang out with Ben Roethlisberger the entire time. So him and Ben just hang out. Everyone already Here's hates Ben. Idea. Just go to the Jets. Sign with the Jets. They got nothing to lose. He can win another. He can win the deal there too. Hey, maybe they could bring Ben in too. There you go. Like the Ford, it'd be like when Arizona just hired away all of the old Pittsburgh Steelers. So they'll be the Pittsburgh of the North. <laughs> Except, isn't Pittsburgh more North than New York? I don't even know. I'll probably get killed for that. <laughs> I need a globe. Does anyone even own a globe in their house anymore? I feel like that used to be a thing. People had them. I don't have one. All right. Anything else you have in the NFL? Um, let me check here. I don't think. Yeah, I know you wanted to talk Tom Brady. You you mentioned it three times. Do you think he ends up a Raider? I don't know at this point. I didn't think there was a legit idea of him leaving New New England. I mean, I'm trying to think where I thought he would go. I thought maybe Philip Rivers, but see, like some of these other guys that are moving around, like if. Pittsburgh could sign one of them to a cheap deal and say, like, we're going to give you a cheap deal. You've already made so many millions. Do you want to win? We have a young, hungry team. We can win with you. Like, could one of those guys actually come in and win? I don't think Tom Brady's going to leave New England and go to L or go to the Raiders now where they Las Vegas. I don't think they're ready to win. 
Like they cut a lot of their pieces. I feel like they're in the middle of a longer term rebuild. Bringing him in is going to get them to what? Eight wins or something. What they have this year? Seven. Yeah. So, I think it puts him in a wild card. Yeah. Wild card. But is that enough to get him to leave new England? I mean, it mm-hmm. seems like every other year he's making a run to the Super Bowl. Do they have any look, weapons? Look, 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 I mean, I guess they kind of do. Rich, I mean, when Gruden got his veteran quarterback and he got Rich Gannon, it made sense. When he went to Tampa Bay, he took Brad Johnson with him. He likes these older quarterbacks to process the terminology and the verbiage a lot better. This would be the ultimate move to, to hire away, and then when inevitably him and Belichick meet, it's the ultimate battle royale. Was it the quarterback or was it the coach? You know that would happen too. They would set that up. They would do anything. Teams would choke. They'd suspend uh, Ben Roethlisberger again. They'd do something to make sure those teams met. The ultimate plot twist. Tim Tebow is the quarterback. (laughs) I don't even know who I could cheer for then. Do I cheer for Tom Brady? Or do I cheer for my man Tim Tebow? (laughs) He's got the jersey made with half Brady, half Tebow. The house divided. Yeah, that would be funny. People would hate it. I would love it. Hey, he does have one more playoff win than, I mean, a lot of these younger quarterbacks. How's Lamar Jackson's playoff record? Tim Tebow's better. <laughs> That's my final thought for the NFL. All right, let's get, it, let's get into the XFL. DC, dude, I told you. I told you DC's a team. Pat Hamilton has them operating at such a high level. They're out there scoring in all facets of the game. They're doing special teams. They're doing defensive pick sixes. They're scoring on offense. Cardell Jones is like a bowling ball. He's just out there running around, taking hits, throwing the ball deep. It's almost like a a Ben Roethlisberger, if you want an XFL guy that can actually run the ball instead of just fumble around in the back of the backfield, taking hits. Cardell can move the ball downfield. He threw a couple up that I was like, okay, bro, what, what are you doing? Just run it. Or throw it away. I feel like he doesn't throw the ball away. But in the XFL, I feel like they have the teams are so close because there's only eight of them that having a serviceable quarterback is making them 100 times better than all the other teams. Look at like Matt McGloin. They got pressure in his face. How many times he just turning the ball over? I knew that was going to be. I watched him at Penn State. Hell, I watched both those quarterbacks because they were both Big Ten guys, and I knew Cardell Jones was going to get that win. They were heavy favorites. Vegas knew. I mean, there were a lot of people that were criticizing that New York and D.C. game. But honestly, the Guardians team reminded me. It was almost like a carbon copy of what the Giants are. Just not being able to move the ball, just getting thumped. What did you hear people complaining about? How boring it was? Well, yeah, they were just saying about how well you can see that it's there's there's absolutely no comparison between the the NFL and XFL, which I mean we've been saying for a while it's not meant to be. Yeah, the, I, that's right. that's what I don't understand. Do people sit down and watch Browns Jets games Thursday night? Because that was a hundred times better than the Browns Jets game. You could see DC actually had something going where they looked like a solid team. If you're watching the Browns and the Jets. Neither of those teams are solid. What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time watching that? That's what I don't understand when people are talking trash on it. I have actually the TV ratings from that game. ABC was the only one to publish at the time of us recording that this. So I'm going to keep with that. They had an average of 2.26 million. Still more than the NBA averages. Their peak was 3 million something. I think the AAF last year dropped to exactly 1 million in their week two, everyone expects to drop off for them not to drop off that much is a big win for the XFL because now I think you're getting established where, okay, the ABC had the 2 PM time slot, I think on Saturday, I think that's what the DC game was on. And so everyone knows tune that in just like college football. That's pretty good ratings compared to a lot of other stuff. Like I said, like NBA or whatever else you put out there, they're not getting the same numbers. So at that point, why not go with the XFL? I would assume it's cheaper. 
if they keep getting a couple million people watching on an afternoon, it's going to be a big ratings win. I saw some things about the attendance and I had some other notes here on that, but um, they said that the highest attended game in the AAF was San Antonio that had over 30,000. But uh, I think Seattle had 29,000 this week in their first home opener. They did say that DC's attendance dropped, but I've heard some people say it was the weather, but guys, it was also Valentine's Day. How many people are going to be able to convince their girlfriend or significant other to go watch an upstart football game in the rain on Valentine's Day? I mean, I know there were some heavy men in that crowd, but I mean, I feel like that's a tough sale. And so we'll see what else happens. They look like they're the team to beat. They're one of two undefeated teams. They're now the favorite at plus 200 to win the championship, which they weren't before. So I feel like their attendance is going to bounce back. And comparing these to some of the other sports, they're getting better attendance than a lot of NBA teams and a lot of NHL teams. Even I would say even some of the Major League Baseball teams, we know, like, uh, what was the one down? Is it the Tampa Bay? They have a team. I, I think they're getting better attendance than what the Rays got. So going head-to-head, you know that they're going to push in. Also, the team in the city that I ripped on last week, Birmingham, they're putting together a pitch, Matt, to join the XFL. They think that they can average 17,000 people and fans, and San Antonio is doing the same thing. But I want to just put it out there for people that they are listening for the XFL here. Fans in the seat matter 0%. The XFL needs the same exact deal that the Big Ten got. Everyone makes fun of Rutgers and Maryland. Nobody cares about them. What they care about is the fact that New York now carries the Big Ten network. That's how many more millions of people. They now care that the D.C. metro area and Upper Virginia carry the Big Ten network, which is big for exposure. That's why you saw Michigan and Penn State and all them start to really kill back in recruiting. What happened to Virginia and Virginia Tech? When the Big Ten got in that area. I mean, Virginia's kind of stepped up, but Virginia Tech has died. They're dead. Will they ever get back? Kids are growing up now. They're seeing the Big Ten teams come to their area. Why would they ever go to Virginia Tech? They go see that stadium, and now that it's not even, is it full anymore? I mean, they barely have any more night games because they're not on TV anymore. But then you can go see uh, Penn State or whatever, Michigan, Ohio State come to town. I feel like it's going to be a tough sale for anyone in that area not to go Big Ten at this point. And you're seeing it in basketball too. So it definitely paid off. That's what the XFL needs to do. They need to look at big television markets. Philadelphia. I mean, what, what are the other ones? I don't, I don't even know where they're missing. Philly is the first one that came to mind. But that's where they're going to go. I'm I'm sorry, Birmingham. If they had a team there, it would be idiotic because no one down there is going to make a blip in TV ratings. You could get 10% people viewing in Philadelphia and beat the ratings that you would get in Birmingham on television. That's just a fact. So I like what they did. I Like I said, I wish that the AAF would have took a different approach, went to big cities that were close to each other and tried to do rivalries. Because that could have been like a manufactured thing. They could have done DC and like uh, Philly or whatever, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Raleigh, Charlotte, teams like that or cities like that that are fairly large. Charlotte has over a million people. They have the Panthers, but you can maybe leverage their stadium and try to get a rivalry with another local team to boost up that attendance. And instead of just having a team, oh, here's a team in the middle of nowhere. Here's another team in the middle of nowhere. Here's a team in Utah. Let's see what happens. So I like the approach. I I think it's going to be, it's going to go well. I like the football. I don't see why people are talking trash on it, but those are my thoughts. What are your thoughts on the XFL week two? Week two. I I liked what I saw from the Roughnecks again, the other undefeated team. Uh, I'm liking June Jones's short play style with his run and shoot offense and pushing the ball vertical. 
the one thing that I, I was thinking about with the XFL, and I think this is where some of the criticisms coming in, is the fact that aside from it being a new league, you're also looking at a shortened group of teams. So when you have a team, when you have the teams like Houston and DC that are performing well, they're going to look a million times better than the bottom tier teams because you're going to see them a lot more. I mean, it's it's almost like the equivalent of if you're constantly watching the Bungles play for as bad as they were this past year. Like if if they're constantly, you're going to think, wow. The NFL sucks because look at look at here they're getting beat down again. You know it's gonna look it's gonna look rough, but there's not a lot of other options for teams to to play. Like you can't bury like Tampa Bay or you can't bury some of these other teams that are winless right now. Oh, I don't think that there's a big gap. I think what it comes down to is coaching, and I think a lot of teams could easily shift that because I think the talent is pretty equal across all the teams because there's only eight teams. The thing that is a main weakness is quarterback. They have guys that weren't successful at the college level quarterbacking some of these teams. And it's like, what are you doing? I mean, we talked about it. I speculated, I was hoping anyway, that they would bring in big time college quarterbacks or at least guys that had wins. Like why not try to get Tim Tebow? But I think those guys are going to command, they're going to want higher salaries than what the XFL is going to be willing to pay because be, because of them factoring in the amount of money that, to keep the the league viable, they're not going to go out. I know we, were, we briefly discussed it last week, but I think they're paying quarterbacks $500 million and you have guys like Colin Kaepernick that are like, yeah, I'll come in for $20 million. And that's like, where it comes down to you give them a percentage of their merchandise. Because, like, I think, like, Colin Kaepernick, he's never going to come in because I don't think he wants to play football. He turned on $14 million, remember? That's the last contract offer he had was $14 million. That's why no one signed him. What team would be that idiotic to sign him for more than that? What, he, what did he win? What were they getting? So, like, in the XFL, yeah, you might be the best quarterback there, but our quarterbacks only make this. We'll give you 50% of all merchandise sales. Are you actually worth the money? And to put it like that, that if I was the XFL, that's exactly what I would do because I'm pretty sure that's how Vince McMahon does some of his WWE marketing, where he came from. They let the guys get it if they can. That's why you see John Cena in a ton of WWE stuff. They, he has his own WWE movies. You had The Rock go and get it. Guys that aren't making the merchandise sales and aren't getting their own money, they're getting cut. They get demoted. They get moved down. They're not the top spot anymore. So I feel like he has that background. Just move it over. Tell Tim Tebow, what are the Mets paying you? How much is that guaranteed? You know they're selling jerseys off you. You're only going to get, what, none? Because they're already paying you. You don't get, like, extra, super, a big cut of that merchandise stuff. So, like, all you have to do is offer that. And do it publicly. Call Kaepernick out. Say, look, if your cause is that big and you don't even want the money, come in and donate your, your cut. Donate it to your cause. And then that's where I think you would really see, I, I don't think it would be backlash, but I think you would really see fighting back from his camp showing that he doesn't want to play football at all. And so it's not even just him. There are some other big-time quarterbacks out there that aren't doing anything right now. I mean, Vince Young, I, I don't know. He's probably not in game shape. But, like, just getting a big name, uh, what could be worse than Matt McGloin, Matt? They, they pulled him. That was such a bad performance. I knew going into that game that that was a lock for DC. That's why I was talking trash last week. So people were like, that's going to be a great game. Uh, New York's going to be great. No, they're not, because you can just look at the quarterback and the coaching. Some of the coaches out there looking lost. There's that video, like the one guy just sitting on the bench. It's like, what are you doing? That's why I, I joked last week about bringing Spurrier in, but I think they should make a push to try to get guys like that. He just showed he was successful in the AAF. He knows how he can win in a shortened season like this. Bring, just bring the Apollos in. I'm sure those guys aren't doing anything right now. Yeah, exactly. You had guys in that league that had quarterbacking experience. Why isn't the XFL reaching out to them? Because they tried to bring in these marketable quarterbacks what happened? You hit on maybe two or three. 
Now you don't uh, have a backup plan. Under, under contract from the AAF. Oh yeah, I'm sure that that's really paying. Whenever they couldn't even pay out their salary checks last year. So, um, that's all I have. You have anything else for the XFL? Nope, that was it. All right, you got anything for high tempo? This week, I know we went long, but well, we did kind of already touch on on the one thing I wanted to bring up with the the transfer portal, but they're they're potentially looking to move that transfer portal window to be effective for the one year rolling to 2020 the 2020 bleh, 2021 season so they're, they're looking to move relatively quick on that which i was surprised because usually when it comes to the ncaa it seems like they kind of drag their feet to to do anything and i think it's just a push because of the lawyer stuff and the laws like i feel like they're gonna start backpedaling and as soon as they start to get pressure it's gonna happen I mean, it, it's all comes down to that. I saw some stuff about like, okay, look at all this recruiting basketball stuff. Like realistically, why would any team not cheat? Why would Bill Self not just start paying Kansas players even more or doing whatever else he was doing? They were already paying players. They've gotten actually zero punishment. Just start paying them more. At that point, like, like what, what's the deterrent? Kansas is ranked third right now, I think. Like, what was the point of that? Louisville's a top 10 team again. They had their little sanction thing or whatever happened to them. They're right back. I think they've been losing, though, so they might not be that high anymore. But really, we're getting the basketball here. I think the number one problem, though, because I don't want want to run out of time, Major League Baseball with the Astros, I think we mentioned at the top of the show, they are not going to be able to put this away. Pitchers are already going are already saying they're going to hit players every time they see them. Like, what is Major League Baseball going to do? P- throw them out? People are going to boo them. A- every game that the Astros go on the road, Matt, they're just going to get ridiculed. And they're going to be, uh, they're going to end up winning the World Series because it's going to end up being a rally cry for their organization. Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. But I wonder at that point, it's almost like. You have people that, and I didn't think about this, but uh, I, I saw a lot of people talking about the Aaron Judge angle. So I, I didn't realize Altuve won the M- MVP or whatever, the player of the year, and uh, he beat out Aaron Judge. And it was the year he was supposedly wearing that stupid buzzer. So how many hits did he have that shouldn't have been hits? And that's a contract thing too, because you can use that for leverage, not just for... Um, salary, but for the Hall of Fame and things like that. So, like, at that point, if they had it proven, they have him on video t- telling him not to take his jersey off, which is weird as hell, and he's walking through the thing, clutching it. Kick him out of the league. They kicked Pete Rose out. The orig- <laughs> that, that other commissioner would have kicked him out. And I know that, like, that's a harsh punishment or whatever, but to me, that's worse than, than uh, taking steroids. Because at that point, your steroids, you still have to work in the gym. You can't just take steroids, Matt, one day and just be like, oh, my God. I, I got to call up the Atlanta Braves, see if they're having a tryout. <laughs> like, that's, that's not how it works. You can't just one day take them and be like, holy cow. Like, what's that movie, the football movie, where the guy tries out for the Eagles? Like, that really doesn't happen anymore. You can't just pop some steroids and be like, oh, my gosh. I'm going to hit 70 home runs. Because guess what? Everyone was on steroids and no one was hitting home runs like that. There was like three or four guys that were doing it. Everyone else was on roids, but we're, we're failing. So at that point, it's like, okay, Major League Baseball had a steroid problem, but everyone blamed it on Barry Bonds like he was the only one. He wasn't. Everybody else was on him. He was just doing it better than everyone because he worked out harder. So I don't think you should penalize him. And actually, that's, that's hearsay. Take that back. Barry Bonds was not on steroids. He was not on steroids. I'm saying on the record, never been proven. They said that they had that Matt. They said they had the list of his test results. They never published it. If they had it and they had his name on it and they wanted me to say that he was on them, they should have published it. That's my final thing. All those other guys that actually did get caught Alex Rodriguez, 
uh, David Ortiz, all those <laughs> like, okay, why is no one hating on them? They're all on TV right now. But my man, Barry, the greatest pirate, the last great pirate. What did I say? That's what should be his nickname for the show. The last great pirate, Barry Bonds. People will be mad because of McCutcheon, but he didn't hit 70 home runs. What do you think, Matt? I, I mean, I don't even know what they would do. Would you pay uh, to see an Astros game? I might, just to see people get plunked. Because I feel like Major League Baseball tried to sweep it under the rug. And now you just have all these like moral warriors that are coming out now and being like, we're going to drill all of the Astros. And, and shame on the Astros for coming on and having the worst press conference in the history of press conferences. Like, they should have just walked out and just flipped everyone off and just walked out. Instead, it'd be like, well, it didn't have any effect on the game. Like, we did something to cheat, and it didn't matter because we cheated and we won. Like, what the hell? <laughs> I know. And then the commissioner of baseball came out and said that the World Series trophy is just a hunk of metal or something like that. It's like, what are you doing? The, yeah. the, they need to call yeah. us up and have us come out with their PR plan because that's not it, chief. You got to downplay it and say how sorry you were and how if you could take it back, you would. And then just quietly raise your banner and glow in front of everyone. You don't do it on the co- press conference and like stumble around. You just do what everyone wants you to do. You apologize, just like all the Hollywood people. You apologize, then they put you back in movies. No big deal. Case closed. So, I mean, it's bad. It's a bad look. Major League Baseball is getting more hype than ever. People right now wouldn't be caring because it's February. No one would care unless you're a diehard baseball fan. But it's on the front page news. People are like, okay, I'm going to might watch an Astros game. I bet. Their ratings are through the roof this year. Just for Astro games. You know how the NBA puts out that thing where it was like, here's our average. Look how great they are. But then everyone else is like way below a million and only like Golden State and like the Cavs and this a couple years ago. But they had like three teams that were the actual ratings. Everyone else was so poor that they just quit putting them on TV. That's what it would be like for Major League Baseball this year. All the networks will be trying to fight for an Astros game. They might hit that guy. (laughs) <laughs> so that's my last thing for baseball uh, you got anything else no nope. uh, I'm getting into my last couple topics the Michigan baseball team is ranked number one Matt the first time a Big Ten school has been ranked number one in baseball a lot of teams said that it couldn't be done they beat Vanderbilt in a rematch of the national championship game and then took down Arizona State another top ten team to get the number one ranking and big shout out to them because I think now you have the softball team. I believe they've been ranked number one and I know they've won a national championship in recent times, but in the 40 year history of the baseball America pool, there has never been a big 10 team ranked number one. And I actually read some stats on this, that that pool was part of the reason why the NCAA regionals changed, which I did not know. So before the in like the 80s or whatever 90s i don't know what year it changed they had one team from each region and that made up the world series so like when michigan got into the world series in the 80s or whatever it was because they were the de facto big 10 team the ncaa stopped doing that and just had a tournament and they took the best teams and that's why you haven't seen like any big 10 teams really make it since then only like a one off here or one off there so to be ranked number 1 is a big deal. Also, speaking of rankings, Penn State basketball. They just lost to Illinois, but they came in this week ranked number nine for a team that I think should be more successful because they have a big budget and they are right, I mean, they're right in the middle of Pittsburgh and Philly. It's less than a three-hour drive to D.C. They should be able to recruit some of these bigger cities just like they do in football, but they've never done it. So are they going to be a pretender? They were one game behind in the Big Ten race. Now they're definitely going to be two games behind. We will see if they are going to make a run or not. But another big shout out to them. Uh, Any Florida State news? I think they were playing tonight, weren't they, against Pitt? 
They were. I, I haven't seen any updates on what that game was. Well, let's be honest. You know, Florida State's going to win that game. No, because this would be the kind of game that Pitt would end up showing up for. Very true. I, uh, I don't know if Pitt has a chance to make the NCAA tournament. There, you're at the point where Penn State basketball is probably going to be more successful than Pitt, and it might not just be this year. It might be for a couple of years if they can keep this going, and that's what I want to see because you're looking at. I don't want to say it's the one and done era because that's kind of past us, but you're looking at a team where you're in the Big Ten. They're getting a ton of money pumped into them from their TV deal. And now you're looking at a team like Penn State that has the advantage of going to play Rutgers. And Rutgers is ranked, or they were ranked. And Maryland is also ranked, or they were ranked. And so now you have Penn State being able to travel to more Eastern cities. And if they start to have success, they can bump into that recruiting and try to actually make a name for themselves and give the Big Ten Conference a very good Eastern basketball block to go with the Midwestern, Michigan, Michigan State, and Indiana teams that have historically been better than most. So a good chance for them to show up just because of the actual – we talked about TV deals like the XFL stuff. That's going to be one where it benefited Penn State more than a lot of other teams in the conference. Adding those Eastern teams does not help Purdue, but it helps Penn State. So can they stick with it long term? And Pitt took a gamble. They joined the ACC thinking that it would help them help them in basketball. It really hasn't. Because now they're not going to those bigger cities anymore. The Big East used think, to be all big cities, Matt. But I think when you look at, at what Pitt, what has Pitt done to boost their standing with basketball? You know, they didn't they didn't sign Jamie Dixon. They didn't put the the you know it, the infrastructure if they're gonna go basketball exclusive. They're sharing the stadium for football. So there, there's the opportunities there for them that if they wanted to put the emphasis on basketball and just say we're a basketball school, that's what you're hanging your hat on. Then you need to, to prove the, that you're doing it because you have Florida State right now. You have North Carolina's on a downswing, but they they are typically March Madness contenders. You have Duke in there. You have a lot of the – like the ACC – has picked up the slack when it comes to their basketball performance. And it's not just the Duke UNC show. So, I mean, they have been um, fielding more competitive teams. And I think Pitt had that opportunity. I think it was there. And now they're, they're in that rebuilding process with Capel there. I think the, well, you're right on the Capel thing and having the rebuilding process there. I think what really hurt them in the short term was their recruiting base shifted because the one big thing for the Big East was they had basketball teams in all of the big major basketball cities. They're able to go play Georgetown in D.C. and get recruits from that area. They're able to go up to Boston when they were playing like Boston College and all those other Big East schools. You're able to pull from all those major cities. When they went to the ACC, not all of those schools went with them. Maryland leaves the ACC, you pretty, they pretty much lost that DC block where Pitt was able to go in and get some guys. And now it's kind of turned to where I said, Penn State's going to get those guys because they're going to get the exposure. They're going to go tell them like, Hey, yeah, we play in this area like two or three times a year. Your family can go to all the games when we come down. Like Pitt doesn't get to do that anymore. And I think that really hurt a lot of the Northern teams in the ACC besides like a historic power like Syracuse because they can get guys from New York if they want and do some national recruiting where Pitt doesn't have that luxury. So I really think that it would have benefited them. And this might be hearsay, but people might hate this. I really think they should have tried to strike a deal with West Virginia. And if West Virginia didn't want to go to the ACC I think Pitt should have held off and tried to keep some of the Big East stuff. I know the ACC move has helped kind of with football, but it's not like they're a world power there. It's not like their stadium's getting filled up. But at least if they would have had a true rival 
now they're kind of floating around in the ACC. I don't know if it's going to be big, uh, good for the long term, but we'll see. But you know, th- you you said about Pitt and the state. I almost think a way, in some ways, looking at Pitt Stadium issue and comparing it to what the expectations are for the XFL is almost a fair comparison when you have when you have some of these bigger cities and they're they're fielding like their their soccer clubs with the smaller stadiums because is Pitt going to fill up the big house is it going to fill up Beaver Stadium right now with the way their program is no so why why have or why push for a venue that's going to have more seating more capacity than what what you need you know i i think you if if you're going to build if you're going to look at it creating that kind of atmosphere i think you you build a smaller or you utilize a smaller facility where you're able to fill it you're able to create that hostile environment and then as the team is improving and you're winning and you're you can build on to that facility you know the, the argument's always been well they don't have their own their own home stadium much like a lot of other programs that, that are in these cities that have to share venues it, it it's a tough it's a tough spot to be in but i think that's one way that you can kind of do that and and maybe make it more of a, a college feel well where would you even put a stadium hasn't a lot of that land been bought up by now a lot of it has been bought up. I, th- I think it's plausible. I'm not 100 percent sure where where it would fit, but I, th- I think that they that Pitt has would have the potential to do it if they chose to. Um, you know, the, the, there's always going to be two sides to it, where you have people saying, "Well, they have they're sharing the stadium. There's no reason they can't they can't just continue to use that venue." But the the people that negatively recruit. Pitt will always say, you don't have your own stadium. You can't fill the stadium that you play in. And and when you look at some of the games that they are televised, when you don't have the, the upper levels filled, it, it isn't a good look for them. Oh, it's a horrible so, look because it's the bright Steelers color. And when, yeah. they, when they were that dark gold, I know they've kind of gone back to the mustard color that I really love. I mean, it was really noticeable whenever they didn't have fans. And I think you're right. I would love for them, and this could be something that I think a design student could work on, if they targeted, Matt, let's say somewhere between thirty and 40,000 people, we'll just go half, 35,000, and they build a stadium that was small at first, that had a ton of luxury boxes, but was designed with the idea that you could put a second level on that would double it in size and make it a 70,000 stadium. Potentially. And then you kind of do what some of like the, um, the bowl stadiums, like Ohio state doesn't have their bowl closed in NC state used to have like a, um, a grass outfield kind of that you would sit on the one side that later got filled in and now has stands and they're up to like 50,000, 60,000 people in that stadium. If Pitt just focused on the lower level and had a row of luxury boxes go around and really push that out to potential, investors, cities, businesses in the area, things like that. Um, Try to get that really pushed up as like a place to go and hang out, kind of like the club level. I think you could get a better environment and then have all the media and stuff and everyone really talk about it, kind of how they do with PNC Park for baseball. Like, oh, this is the greatest baseball arena. They could really talk about it as, hey, this is one of the best venues to go see a game because the media, if they have all these luxury boxes, they're going to talk about how awesome it is. Notice how the media never talks about like how one of those big stadiums are. They always say it's an awesome atmosphere. They never say it's a great stadium because they're usually just shoving as many people in as possible. Pick could take that other approach, learn from the pirates, build a media friendly place that everyone talks about how awesome it is. And then you're going to get the extra benefit. People aren't going to talk about how small it is. They're going to talk about how much they loved going to watch pit play. And then like you said, once they have the success on field, then you build maybe the two sides and, and uh, attendance increases back up to 50,000. Then you have each end zone. You do one, have like a horseshoe type shape, 
go to 60 and then put the last one on for 70 if you ever get to that point. And if you don't, who cares? Sell all what you have and then tickets are in demand and you jack the prices up. Because right now it's hard to sell season tickets when people are like, why would I pay a couple hundred bucks for season tickets when I know the stadium is empty? Think of how much they could really jack it up when Penn State's on the schedule, Matt. $1,000 for season tickets? People would pay. Well, and, and I think that may even be part of the issue is that when you have that and people will, will buy the season tickets just for that game and then squat on the rest of them, the, the, then the game, the game, other ones are technically sold out, but there's no, there's no physical bodies in the seats. Well, that's where I think they should have teamed up with West Virginia and figured something out. It's great that they're adding Penn State back on the schedule and West Virginia in the future, but they don't have it worked out where they have one more key game a year that brings in fans. No one cares about anyone on their schedule. They might get a national audience, but no one's going to say, oh, UNC, they're ranked top 10. I'm gonna, that's a must-see college football game. People are probably thinking, oh, North Carolina sucks. They've never been good. Like that, they're overhyped. Like you might get Clemson or Miami or Florida State bringing back in Notre Dame. I mean, Notre Dame is one of the big names, but Pitt could very easily look at their schedule and try to work something out where they rotate getting a home game with either West Virginia or Penn State. And the ACC only has an eight game schedule. So cut out the Big Ten team that you've been playing, Iowa or whatever other team you have on the schedule. And just rotate between your rivals. Try to get it on like a rivalry week type thing. Bring West Virginia back. I know West Virginia has some issues with the Big 12 scheduling. But just rotate. Play two tough out-of-conference schedules and two cream cakes. The ACC is not tough. You could lose to both West Virginia and Penn State in the year and probably still win the Coastal. Let's be honest. It might toughen your guys up, help you with recruiting. That's my last thing for that. Uh, my last thing for the final bell, John Beeline is in the process of stepping down, just like uh, Michigan State hiring a coach right after the show. As soon as we finish this and I post it, he's probably stepped down, so I'm going to give my a- analysis like he's already stepped down. I don't know why he jumped to the Cavs. He left Michigan, and I thought it was an awful move by his part, and it, the timing was bad. It was very similar to when D'Antonio left Michigan State and I made fun of them. Beeline didn't leave Michigan in a good position last year. He left after the NBA draft. I think he was mad that a couple of his guys went early because there were two guys. Right now, I think one of them's averaging a point per game and the other guy's shooting like 20% in the NBA. If they would have came back, Michigan probably would have been a preseason top five team. They've been ranked in the top 10 this year, had some injuries right around the the top 25 right now. I think if you bring those guys back, you have a hell of a team coming back with Beeline. I think he sticks. I think he just got tired of the one and dones, and he was never a strong recruiter, for being honest. So you're going to the NBA where he doesn't have to recruit. But those guys didn't listen to him. So it's almost like, yeah, you're at the point. Your age is up there. You, you knew it wasn't going to work out. I just don't know why he went to the Cavs. Go somewhere else where they have a culture of team ball. He interviewed with the Pistons. They were the last real team to win a championship and not just be a bunch of guys. They weren't supposed to win those championships in the, in the 2000s when they had Rip Hamilton and Ben Wallace and all those guys. They weren't supposed to win. They played as a team. Everyone hated them. Everyone wanted the superstar teams to win. That's what Beeline should have went to a franchise like that. I don't know if he actually got the offer or what. I feel like if he wanted to go, he could have made it work. But everyone knew the Cavs were going to be a rebuild because LeBron left. LeBron gut, guts the team whenever he goes to a team. And then they fall apart because he brings in all his buddies. Like you knew the Cavs were not a good team. I don't know why you went there. And now he's already older than Tom Izzo and stuff like that. Where does he go from here? Does he retire as a big failure in the NBA? Because you hurt your Michigan legacy by leaving when you did. There was no farewell tour. There was nothing. You you went to two national championship games. 
I mean, if the guys came back on last year's team, you might have went to a third this year. You never know. But now it's like everything's dead. Michigan's in a way better spot. I'm not even going to lie. Look at their recruiting. Look at their recruiting right now. Number one in the Big Ten, top five class overall. It might be their best class ever and with the recruiting rankings. You could say the Fab Five class, but that was like before there were recruiting rankings like there were today. So this could be Michigan's best class coming off Beeline's team. And he's a failure. Juwan Howard comes in, recruits like gangbusters, has his team. A, they're going to make the tournament most likely unless they choke down the stretch here. But I, I would think that they're a lock at this point. They've already beaten Gonzaga. Gonzaga's only loss is to Michigan. They have a, another top 25 win over Creighton. Uh, another couple non-conference wins and uh, some big wins like they just beat Michigan State in a much better position than what Beeline's facing. I would hate for him to come back and land with like Indiana or someone like that. Just because I have a feeling that that's what's going to happen. But I, it's like, it's almost like it has to be a bad dream for him, Matt. Has to be. One day you're just like, I'm fed up with these college kids. I'm going to the NBA. Oh my gosh, it's a hundred times worse up here. That, that old saying, sometimes the grass isn't always greener. Everyone was talking trash on him in the media, calling him out, doing things like that, not listening at practice. He said that he wanted to try to coach at all levels. So if he wasn't lying, he did it. He failed. He could try to find another team. I mean, I, like I said, I think some teams with their culture – could work, but you knew the Cavs were not going to work. The t- players have been running that team since LeBron got there 20 years ago or uh, however long he's been in the league. So you're looking at that, a bad, bad program. It would be like when people say Harbaugh's going to come back or Urban Meyer's going to jump to the NFL and coach the Browns. Hell no, they're not. They didn't become great coaches by making poor ass decisions like that. <laughs> When Urban Meyer said about the Cowboys being like a dream job, he knows that they're going to have the resources in place to get him the guys he needs. If he goes to there, you're looking at the Cowboys or the Browns. Like if you're a coach, who would you be kidding if you went to the Browns? Like everyone would know. They're like, wow, that's like a kamikaze move right there. What is he thinking? So Beeline just did that. Left Michigan for the Cavs. And now where's he going to go? The WNBA? Ivy League, but there's not many other teams he's 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 coached. He coached all the levels in college. WNBA would be a, a professional league that you haven't done it. It would be nice if or it'd be interesting to see if he did win a championship there or something. But at this point, I don't know. Too old. Hate to see it. Wish he would have had some success, but I mean, the way he left Michigan, didn't care for it. If he would have won a national championship, I then he could have left on his own terms or whatever. I know he brought Michigan back from the dead as a program, but whatever. Any thoughts on that? Mm, no, we're good with that. Anything for the final bell? Because I know we went long today. Got got all fired up over the NFL stuff. I, you didn't think they should suspend Miles Garrett for one more game? They should. Well, we should just just blacklist them then. We'll just, just, just wait till the tape comes out where Mason Rudolph's just throwing 100 racial slurs around and then I feel like an idiot. Um, actually, I was I was curious to see that, you know, we, we talk about the, the light sentencing for Miles Garrett and Manchester City's been banned from the Champions League for the next two seasons after being found guilty of breaching financial and fair, fair play rules. So, they're cheating and they get a two year ban. Major League Baseball, they get their championship trophy called just a metal pile of junk. I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because I actually had that in my notes. I just skimmed over them. But I mean, you look at one sport, Manchester City is like the Yankees. At least that's how I understand it. So that would be like the Yankees cheating and getting kicked out of the MLB for like two years. Yeah. They're like, hey, actually, I guess the championship league or Champions League is like 
their international thing. So it'd be like, like the Yankees being able to play during the regular season, win the pennant, but then that's it. No World Series championship for you. Kind of like that. So, wow. Astros, they're like, yeah, no big deal. We weren't cheating that much. We only cheated a little bit. Dang it. We cheated, but it didn't really help us win. Come on, who are you joking? We only won the World Series. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, didn't they win it twice? Yeah. Idiot. Or no, wait, did the Red Sox win the other one? I think the Dodgers just lost it twice to two cheating teams. Notice how everyone turned off the Red Sox because that's like one of the MLB darlings. They were like, could the Red Sox have been cheating the entire time? Were they cheating to break the curse? Tune in this week to not find out. That's like what the MLB is doing. We'll focus on the Astros. Yeah, we have the trash can banging guy. That's great. Teams should do trash can giveaways where they give you like a a small replica trash can lid to throw on the field when the Astros are announced. Yeah, you just they could have the promotional night. Bring your own trash can to the game. I think I have a Bob Nuttings phone number around here somewhere. I'll call him up and see. I'll say you should get that out. Have people throw trash cans on the field when the Astros come to town. Because that would be funny. That would be a good move. And I w- hope some team does it. It won't be the Pirates. Because it would be filled with Astros fans. And I don't think that they would throw trash cans at their own guys. <laughs> you got to do it at the Dodgers. I'll call up their owner. I'll say, hey, you guys should have a trash can night. I'll say, don't even thank me. Just do it so that I can talk about it on the show. <laughs> don't, don't even have to give me credit. <laughs> Uh, but that's it. You got anything else for the show? Nope. Just check out our website. There's some good stuff on there. Get caught up on what you missed. Yeah. Check that out. Anything you want us to talk about, let us know. And um, definitely, definitely watch the XFL. Keep cheering on DC because they're going to do great. No jinx. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. 